Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Diana Chenique, a Senior Program Analyst for the Hispanic and Latino Communities at the Office of Minority Health Research Center. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. All webinar attendees will be placed on mute. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box on the right bar of your screen. We will have time for questions at the end of the webinar. The webinar is being recorded. All registered participants will receive an email with a recording link, including a link for the evaluation. At the end of the webinar, a window will pop up as well with a quick evaluation. Please provide us with your feedback. Thank you. Next slide now. The Office of Minority Health under the Department of Health and Human Services was established in 1986. Currently, under the leadership of Dr. Lin, the Office of Minority Health oversees the implementation of the HHS Action Plan to reduce racial and ethnic health disparities in the National Partnership for Action to end health disparities and the work on key HHS priorities, including the opioid epidemic, childhood obesity, and serious mental illness. In the next slide, we have sorry, in the next slide, we have the objectives for today's webinar, the role of faith leaders in health ministries in improving the health of health communities. The first objective is the word is to spread the word about type 2 diabetes prevention and diabetes management. Organize type 2 diabetes prevention and diabetes management of activities in your church. Create an environment that supports health choices within your church. And four, to strengthen collaboration among other organizations, as it is the case today. Thank you. Next slide, please. Now I have the opportunity to introduce the speakers for today's webinar. We have Ms. Alexis Williams. Alexis is a public health advisor, advisor for the National Diabetes Education Program at the Centers for Di uh, Disease Control and Prevention. The focus of her work is developing and delivering training and technical assistance for NDEP programs and resources. Ms. Betsy Rodriguez. She is the Deputy Director of the National Diabetes Prevention Program at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Diabetes, a diabetes educator and health disparities supporter for the health and well-being of racial and ethnic minorities and vulnerable populations in the United States and Latin America. We also have as a guest today Mr. Wayne Smith. He's a director of the Samaritan Ministry at the Central Baptist Burden, Burden in um, Knoxville, Tennessee. There he founded the, in 1996 this organization to respond to the HIV and AIDS need in, uh, for services in the community. He leads the Samar Samaritan Ministry in HIV and AIDS services organization that is um, located in the community around uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. The ministry provides care and support for people living with HIV and AIDS and other educational materials and services on the subject. Next slide, please. And now with you, Ms. Alexis Williams. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar. Uh, we're really excited to talk to you a bit more about um, ways safe communities can get involved in addressing diabetes. So next slide. So if you joined us for our webinar, I think that was last month when we talked about diabetes prevention and management tools for congregations, we talked really broadly about um, type 2 diabetes prevention and a bit about diabetes self-management education and support, and we gave some pretty broad strategies for ways that faith communities could get involved. Next slide. 
So we left off with some general advice about ways you could get started in terms of learning about diabetes in your community and engaging community partners um, and some tips about um, just some basic tips. And we had a lot of questions about people wanting more specific strategies for how to make this all work. Next slide. So we had a lot of, wait, I have questions. So we talked really big picture and what we would like to do today is get more into the specific strategies that faith communities have been using to address diabetes um, and diabetes prevention in their communities. Next slide. So we'll talk about the role of faith-based organizations in addressing diabetes, how you all are part of the team, supporting people who have diabetes or who are at risk for type 2 diabetes. We'll talk about some specific strategies for ways that faith communities get involved, and we'll talk about some resources to help you get begin planning. Next slide. So preventing type 2 diabetes and managing diabetes is a team effort. Um, you have a person who has uh, pre-diabetes or has type 2 diabetes, and they work with health care providers to provide their clinical care. Um, we, it's really important for them to be going to diabetes self-management education and support classes or support, support services from um, trained diabetes educators um, and community health workers who help them with the knowledge and skills they need in order to manage their condition. Or people who have pre-diabetes, we have type 2 diabetes lifestyle change programs in communities where, again, a person works with a trained lifestyle coach to help them um, uh, take on behaviors that will help them reduce their risk for uh, getting type 2 diabetes. And because managing diabetes or managing pre-diabetes is a lifestyle change, family and friends play an important role as well in terms of helping people make the changes that are needed in order to um, improve their health. So where do community-based organizations and faith communities stand? What, what is the ground that you all stand on that maybe some of these other organizations don't provide or don't have the skills to provide or don't have the resources to provide? Where do you fit in the team? Next slide. Um, Faith-based organizations, one, are a trusted source of information. So people uh, who are members of faith communities will look to their faith leaders and the members of their faith community for reliable, trusted information. Um, the faith community, more so than some of the other team members, understand the values and the customs of the people that you work with. So you're able to provide education and resources and support in a way that's meaningful to people um, and provide support that's meaningful and familiar. So you, you're you all about caring for people. And the care that faith communities provide their members is the kind of care that you really can't get um, from any other place. And when you're talking about a condition like diabetes or any of the, of the other chronic conditions where people are trying to manage their lifestyle day in and day out for the rest of their lives, that care is essential um, because you need someone there to, to, to walk with you and help you as you walk that journey to, to good health. Next slide. So we through research and different um, interventions and uh, just different reviews, have identified three key roles that faith communities play in addressing diabetes and addressing um, a lot of different chronic diseases. The first is to promote healthy li living, and that includes providing links to recognized or accredited diabetes self-management and education support services or type 2 diabetes prevention lifestyle programs. We'll talk a little bit about that and creating a um, healthy environment. So let's start by talking about promoting healthy living. Next slide. Uh, there are many different ways to promote healthy living. The, the sort of first one, most obvious one is awareness raising activities, and that's just about spreading the word. People, especially people with prediabetes, are not aware that they may have the condition. They're not aware of the risk factors. They're not aware that they may need to get screened, and they're not aware that these lifestyle change programs exist 
to help them um, turn around their risk and reduce their risk for getting type 2 diabetes. People with diabetes may not be aware of the need for ongoing um, care and support. And so one critical role that faith communities play is just making people aware of their their risk and that and that there is something they can do about diabetes. So giving people hope that they can take control of their health and, and make changes that will improve their, their quality of life. Um, faith communities are also an excellent place for educational programs that teach knowledge and skills. Whether that is led by people in the faith community or you partner with uh, another uh, organization outside of the faith community to bring those resources in to the faith community, those are excellent ways to reach people in a place that they go to anyway, that's close by, that's familiar, that's comfortable, and that makes sense to people. Um, and then the third way to promote healthy living, that's, I think a, um, a real special place for faith communities is support groups. That we know that members are stronger together. And it's difficult for people with diabetes and people with pre-diabetes to find support that includes the family. And I think faith communities are really good at providing those kinds of support groups or support services or discussion groups or just uh, people talking with each other where families can talk together and, and deal with the stresses of living with a chronic condition. Next slide, please. So the second thing we talked about was promoting links to diabetes self-management education and support services or lifestyle change programs. Um, and there are three basic ways that faith communities go about doing this. One is raising awareness that these programs even exist. <laughs> and linking people to the program, so letting people know where in your community can you go for diabetes self-management education or where can you go for type 2 diabetes prevention courses. Um, another key way um, that faith communities help is by offering space for programs. So it, these programs work better when they're in a place that people can actually access, that people don't have to travel long distances or go out of their way to reach them. If they're in a place where people are already going, they're more likely to go. And they're more likely to feel comfortable in a place that always already feels like home to them. And we also have some faith communities that offer these programs. So uh, either through partnering with a, a, another community-based organization or becoming a recognized provider themselves, um, faith communities become a recognized or an accredited provider of lifestyle prevention courses um, or working with uh, healthcare providers providing DS in, the, in, their, uh, in their church home. Next slide. And then the third thing we talked about was creating healthy environments. And this is all about making it easier for people to make a healthy choice. Um, so people don't have to go out of their way uh, to make a healthy food choice or to be physically active. Increasing access to healthy foods and drinks, not only in the, 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 the place of worship, but also in the broader community around. And we've seen faith communities get involved with making sure kids have healthy snacks at school um, or places to be active, making sure the people in the community have places to be active by either opening up the church facility to, for people to be active or by working with others in the community to make the community safer um, and looking at things like lighting and crime and, and sidewalks um, or walking groups and just different ways that make, that make people, um, make it easier for people to make a healthy choice, particularly for people who have difficulty getting around. And faith communities get involved with programs like Silver Sneakers to help older adults and people with physical disabilities become more active. Um, and that has been a real benefit to many communities. Next slide. So where do you start? Um, and it, it begins with um, assessing your needs and resources and going through a process of figuring out what's actually going to work for your community and um, putting a plan in place. And uh, we have a training on our, it's an online training on our website that walks faith communities and um, community-based organizations through this process of 
planning their programs. Bessie's going to talk a little bit more about actually what these steps look like and how you go about implementing them in your church. Um, and so I'm going to hand it over to Betsy, and I'm going to put the link to this training in the chat box for you all. Betsy? Thank you, Alexis. That was such a great um, introduction to what we're trying to accomplish here today. So as you may know, today's growing church, faith-based communities need powerful tools and resources to help them lead their health education and promotion efforts to be a success. The CDC National Diabetes Education Program, as Alexis just told you, developed in English and Spanish a free cost online course that is available in our website, and it's called Developing Community-Based Program for People with Diabetes. It is a basic introduction course to the ways community-based organizations can help support people with diabetes from promoting healthy lifestyles and providing support to creating environments when people can have can make healthy food choices, as Alexis explained to you all a few minutes ago. Faith-based organizations and community-based organizations played an important role in helping people with diabetes or at risk to learn how to manage their condition or how to prevent it. Take this course to learn more about what your organization can do and how to get started. It will be a good source for you if you're thinking, where do we start? The link is in the slide, and Alexis will be including that in the chat box. So it will explain, I will explain quickly in the next couple of slides a summary of the steps to start your faith-based program. Next slide, please. So there are many models for addressing congregational health and wellness programs. It is important that you give some thoughts to identify what kind of model program you would like to implement. Look to what the evidence says it works. One place to look at, at the available evidence is the Community Preventive Services Task Force, and I will include the link in the, in the chats in a few minutes. There are right now around 31 systemic reviews showing the evidence of what works at the church and at the community levels in different conditions that is included. You may not want to reinvent the wheel. The message here are that the first step is that in order to get the buy-in from the get-go, you need to make sure what uh, works from the evidence and what is it that you would like to explain. For example, the first step, and it's here in the slide, you need to get the buy-in from the get-go, but in order to get that, you need to be very sure what is it that you're trying to accomplish at your church. Are you planning to start a structured program within the church that focuses on preventing, on providing health education, promoting well-being, and improving the health of the congregation? Will this include the community too? Are you going to implement activities that can range from providing health education to raising awareness about church members? Or are you planning to provide a structured lifestyle um, intervention or diabetes health management education and support program for the congregation or it will include the community. So these are the kind of questions that you need to start um, asking yourself so you can get the buy-in from the get-go. It's important that you make sure that you know what is it that you want to accomplish in your church-based community. Next slide. So now that you know what is it that you want to accomplish, what is next? So step number two will be to meet with your church leader or congregational leadership to get the permission and, to for, and, and support to begin. So it's very important, and Wayne will get into this detail, why this is so important in order to be a success. So step number three will be looking for your organization capacity issues, for example, what kind of volunteers do you want to support your activities? So you will have to make like a profile of those volunteers that you're looking for so you can recruit them. Remember, they don't need to be health professionals. They should have an interest in serving the congregation and our community and have um, a spirit to the servicio, spirit of services. So do I have a consistent space to meet? Do I have supporting resources like AV equipment, phone, photocopier? And it would be good for you to start doing an inventory and invest your assets to see what is it that you're needed in order to do what you're planning to do. Next slide. So then what is next? As step number four, we are suggesting to find out what people need and want, which is a need assessment, 
Your goal should be to get the entire congregation to complete a need assessment, and there are many, many, many templates available for you to do that. The result of the assessment will help you to we develop programs and activities that meet the needs of your congregation. You also may want to do a second assessment, and we are suggesting around the six months of your implementation to identify if there has been any change in their health or knowledge, their attitudes, or their behaviors. And remember, it is very important to keep information on individuals confidential. Next slide. So then what is next? It is important that you share the compiled group results of the assessment with the church leaders and the congregation. And then after that, you have all the information in your hands to develop an implementation plan. And in, if you go to uh, the um, course that I was talking about before, you will find there how to develop an implementation plan. Then a step seven will do planning a kickoff celebration to introduce your activities or programs to the congregation, and then finally promote, promote, promote. There is another good resource that I would like to share with you. Uh, there is an, another CDC NDP course, which is how to make health communication work for your program. This is an online course too, and this will help you with the, this last step of promoting your program. And again, I will be including the link in the chat box. Next slide. Then sustainability. It is important to understand the factors that influence the program capacity for sustainability. And it's also important to develop an action plan to increase the likelihood of sustainability of your program. What keeps effective programs sustained over the time? Believe it or not, it, take, it takes more than just money. Looking across programs, you often see that even with the same level of funding, some programs are able to sustain themselves and some, unfortunately, are not. So sustainability capacity is the ability to maintain programming and its benefits over the time. To improve capacity for sustainability, we encourage threatening the structure and processes that exist within your organization to ensure you can strategically leverage resources to weather the changes and challenges that come on your way. The first step in improving sustainability capacity is to build your understanding on the factors that impact a program. For example, you may want to um, determine which program elements need to be maintained, eliminated, or adapted. That's why evaluation, as part of the plan that I was talking about before, will include the elements of evaluation as well in that plan and will help you determine what are the program um, activities that need to be maintained, eliminated, or adapted. Then you would like to prioritize the areas of sustainability first, and then it's important that you have to develop a sustainability action plan with specific action steps. Um, and then we assess this capacity uh, as program is evolving. Um, next slide. Here, I have a study that I would like to share with you. I think it's very insightful information that is worth the effort to record. This is a study that provides an understanding on how the religious leaders perceive the role in diabetes related programs. They conduct a of interviews with 10 members of the library in Mexico for several three years since. For example, maintain open lines of communication about health, and involvement in diabetes programs. The results indicate the importance of the support from the religious leaders in health programs. So, as you can see from this study, um, that uh, I think it would be important to highlight with you. by understanding community members, um, by understanding also how faith is a healing instrument that cross between spiritual and physical healing, and finally the involvement in diabetes program from educating and educating others, and the importance of partnership with organizations. Next slide. Uh, 
so, for example, is maintaining um, open lines of communication. In this study, respondent mentioned that it, it is important to understand the needs of their congregation and their community. This pastor used this form of communication to assist uh, the members and, and the community with their needs, such as person to person. They use social media, use newsletters, and they use magazines. They were um, sharing supportive and cheerful messages to those affected with chronic conditions and were giving the people the sense of hope that the church getting support and the healing process of any conditions that they may have. Um, then the last one involving in diabetes programs. And due to lack of resources, there uh, there are not a lot of diabetes education programs offered at faith-based organizations. However, most of these studies would like to have programs at the church if they were funded. Religious leaders explain that they need to get educated about diabetes as well as strength and work for partnership with social and healthcare um, institutions to better serve the community. Next slide. So in conclusion um, of this study, there have to be healthcare providers uh, to work with faith-based organizations to help people with diabetes achieve better quality of life. And although the major role of faith-based organization is to promote spiritual health, it can also influence physical and mental health. Leaders also recognize the need to become more involved with medical professionals to address the needs of people with diabetes. And to also acknowledge that healthcare providers and religious leaders should establish beneficial partnerships. Next slide. So I have the privilege to introduce Wayne Smith, who will be talking about his experience working at the church level. And I decided to hand over to him that I get it. The church is an institution that can do and should do more around health issues for the communities that come to our doors. So Wayne, the mic is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you to the uh, Office of Minority Health Resource Center for this invitation to be uh, with you today. I'm Wayne Smith and I'm director of Samaritan Ministry, which is a uh, faith-based uh, HIV and AIDS uh, organization in Knoxville, Tennessee. You can go to the next slide, please. And uh, we've been serving the HIV AIDS community in Knoxville since 1996. Uh, it's been a real pleasure for us to be able to do that uh, out of a local church here in Knoxville. And what I want to do today is to just tell you a little bit about what has happened with our organization, our church, and our community um, on, on the issue of HIV and AIDS, which is our focus. But I think many of the themes uh, that uh, have been important to us certainly apply to some other settings uh, with some other chronic diseases. Next slide. For us, it was important, I think, in the beginning to have a personal story that our congregation could identify with. Um, for us, that was a Jimmy Allen story. Uh, Dr. Allen was, a, was pastor of a large Texas Baptist church. He was well known in the community. He had TV and radio program was a former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and his personal story about uh, HIV and AIDS affecting his family in a church that was very much perhaps like ours in Knoxville, uh, provided that personal touch for our congregation. And uh, his story uh, of the failure of the church to support him and his family uh, really uh, called us out, called out other churches around the country to, to look at their own actions uh, and failure to act around the issue of HIV. For us, this personal story of Dr. Allen's opened up a dialogue around sex and sexuality, a compassion for people living with HIV, and could certainly do that for other chronic conditions where stigma stands out and is a big part of living with that condition, hepatitis C being one of those other conditions that certainly comes to mind for me. Part of our strategy was in the beginning was to 
use experts from our own church. We gathered together medical professionals and educators to develop a specific strategy. And of course, we had to have our pastor's support and approval, and that was critical to uh, our, our ministry forming and getting started in the very beginning. Next slide. One of the uh, early pieces of uh, framework that we used to form our ministry was from Don Messer's book published in 1994, I believe, uh, Breaking the Conspiracy of Silence, and it's about the worldwide and the American uh, HIV epidemic. And Dr. Messer uh, ha has four keys in his book that really have been a framework for our ministry work. At the, in the beginning in 1996 and, and still today, these are the backbone of our ministry work. To challenge negative and judgmental attitudes that exist toward people affected for us uh, around HIV and AIDS and by other chronic conditions as well. Christians have to stand up. Christians have to be counted. And it's unacceptable for people of faith to harbor negative uh, and judgmental attitudes about people in their community, uh, regardless of where they come from. So that's a key here for our church and our congregation. And of course, we need to provide accurate information to our, to our church and its members. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there about lots of things. And we believe it's American ministry, and certainly I think our church has always supported that science is the basis for the things we teach about disease. And education, praying for people to get well and to improve their health and giving people prayer support is, is very important and it's important to our church. But we need to understand that medicine, uh, research, great doctors and nurses and the work that they do are all a part of God's creation. And we need to learn and know and share uh, accurate information for people. One of the most important things is to allow a church to be personal with people who are living with, again, for us, HIV, by providing personal pastoral support for people who are living with this condition. And that means getting close to them. That means bringing them in, um, going to them if that's what it takes. Uh, and remembering that families are a part of this. People don't live with chronic disease in isolation. And it's important for families to be a part of discussion and for families to know they're a part of the solution. Um, lastly, and I'll, I'll hit this point uh, a few more times here, is to engage in prayerful dialogue with other churches, uh, other faith communities, and with secular organizations in the community. All too often, I think in church communities, we, we uh, we build walls around ourselves and we interact with people who are like us that believe like we do, think like we do, have the same politics that we do. And, uh, and there's real value in reaching out beyond those things that make us uh, alike and to reach beyond those walls out into the community among people who are different than we are. Next slide. So we actually published a brochure a few years ago um, that looked at the model that, that really worked for us from the beginning. And I want to share some things with you and tell you at least a couple of stories around this, around these topics. Um, first of all, this doesn't happen quickly. If you're starting something new in your church, a new ministry, a new effort, uh, patience is so important. There were some places that we identified that we needed to be, that we needed to be working, we needed to be doing HIV testing. We identified these places in the beginning, and it took us 10 years in some cases to get into those places. We had to move slowly, and that means building relationships and trust, um, and that can't be overstated. So don't be impatient when the door slammed in your face. Uh, just persevere. And remember that if God's in this, uh, you'll get to those places where you need to go in his time. Um, might not be in your time, though. Uh, keep that in mind. Um, the value 
of Christians showing up in unexpected places cannot be understated. And I want to tell you a story that illustrates this. In the uh, late 90s, as we were trying to get started, and we were doing everything we could to learn about the HIV epidemic in our city, I went to a training at the Knotts County Health Department. This, uh, this training uh, was conducted by a woman named April, and I had registered, and she knew I was coming. And when I walked in the room, I was a couple of minutes late. And I walked into the room, and uh, she introduced me. She said, oh, there's Wayne Smith from Central Baptist Church of Bearden. And the, uh, the whole room broke out into applause. Uh, I was stunned. I didn't, know, I didn't know what that was about. I didn't understand you know, what was happening. I sat down sheepishly in my in my chair and tried to figure out why uh, I had nobody knew that nobody there knew me and I didn't know anybody in the room. Um, I found out at the end of the meeting when an elderly woman came up to me, put her arms around me and cried, and said told me that she'd been waiting 20 years for the church to show up. We need to be in places where we're not expected to be. There are community organizations and community groups in your city and in your town that are working on these chronic health conditions about which you care so much. And in many cases, these are not-for-profit folks and government folks, and often the faith community is not there. And so we need to show up in these places. Our presence makes a difference. And we need to start out by listening and watching we don't have to be in charge. Uh, we need to volunteer and start out uh, helping these existing uh, programs be more successful and learn alongside our brothers and sisters who work in the community. Demonstrate your faith by being an example, by being a servant. I'm a Baptist, and so Baptists know that you feed people first. Um, food is a great... Uh, leveler of all people we all love it and so that reminds me that we need to minister to physical need first our lord taught us to visit people in jail and to be with people when they're sick and take them clothing when they're naked uh, certainly a great example when we go into these places we don't need to preach and we certainly don't need to judge and touching people who are suffering is really magic next slide So uh, how, do we, um, how do we get folks on board? Well, I already mentioned it takes time. Engaging key leaders is so very, very important. Um, for Samaritan Ministry in 1996, one of the senior adult women in our church, the first female deacon at our church, um, got behind our ministry. She thought an HIV AIDS ministry was exactly what our church needed to do. And having that key respected leader on board for us was really important to getting our ministry going. I suggest you look for those key leaders in your congregation who can make this go. And you certainly have to have pastor buy-in. Speaking of pastor, uh, when we were getting started, my pastor, uh, who's now retired uh, from our church, but he gave me some really sage advice. He said, Wayne, stay away from controversy. He said, don't make this ministry a gay ministry. And he acknowledged that we we're going to be in, in a ministry like an HIV and AIDS ministry working with a lot of, in particular, gay men. And he said, you know, that's where we need to be. And that's, that's where the thrust of your ministry probably is headed. But let's make this a ministry about taking care of people who are sick, because that's what our congregants can identify with. That's where we need to focus, and that has been great advice for us. I already talked about food. Uh, the picture you see here uh, in this slide is uh, a, a project that we use called the Hope Bucket Project. And the Hope Bucket is a bucket filled with toiletry articles that we give as a gift to one of the AIDS service organizations in our city. And they're distributed to HIV patients uh, as a Christmas gift. We're getting ready to kick that project off here in a week or so at our church. Uh, this is a great toe-in-the-water project for people in our church. 
So if, you're, if your mission is going to take you in places where it's difficult to go, uh, homeless shelters, under the bridge, um, food kitchens, places where people might be uncomfortable and feeling outside of their comfort zone, this is a great way to get people involved in a way that's safe and comfortable. And it, for us, it has led to a lot of people becoming volunteers in other ways. Information about this project and all of our, all of our uh, printed materials are available on our website. And you'll see a link to our website at the end of this presentation. Remember to work well with others. Collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Next slide. I'm not going to go through this list with you in any detail, but I do want everyone to see that playing well with others is really important for the success of a ministry. And you'll see in this slide that this is not a list of churches. We do have great faith partners in, in, in our work, but we also have government agencies, not-for-profits. Uh, on this list are many local local companies that have decided to pilot to partner with us. Um, and we're grateful for all of these partnerships. To me, this is an illustration of how we need to remember that we have to work in our community, outside the walls of our church, to find all of the possible partners that we can. Next slide. So I put in a few pictures to show you today to illustrate uh, my, my my point here on playing well with others. The slide in the middle is a testing event that we did at a church a couple of years ago, and I want to tell you who these three great uh, women are in this in this particular slide. On the left, with the short hair, is Stacy. Stacy's a a volunteer with Samaritan Ministry Ministry, a member at our church. And she's a great volunteer for us. Has been for many years. In the middle is Tori. Now Tori is a community outreach worker with Planned Parenthood. Yeah, you heard me say it, Planned Parenthood. Um, and on the right is a, a woman who is a um, disease intervention specialist at the Knotts County Health Department. Her name is January. You see, um, while Stacy in January and Tori might have differing views on a lot of issues regarding religion and, and social construct and probably even politics, they sit together and, as you can see, and love each other, uh, sitting side by side in the context of how can, we, how can we go to an event and provide HIV testing in our community to help end this epidemic. Instead of focusing on those things that separate us, it's critical for us to work on those things that bring us, bring us together. This, the picture in the lower left is another testing event that's uh, Judy Reutemann on the left. She's also with Knotts County Health Department. That's me in the middle. And uh, Mel Daniels is a great partner of ours. She works with a large uh, not-for-profit organization in Knoxville called the Helen Ross Mab Center. The other three pictures of, of, are of our visit uh, this year to the United States Conference on AIDS with some of the people that we met and encountered there. I uh, want to let you know that when we go to the United States Conference on AIDS, and we go every year, it's a very large domestic HIV conference, we are um, usually the only faith-based organization in the exhibit hall. Um, and uh, that means that the presence of Jesus Christ is in the room, and it's not about us, it's not about Central Baptist Church of Bearden, it's about uh, Jesus being in the room. Very, very important. Next slide. So how do we keep this going? Um, we keep this going by creating a multi-source uh, funding a stream. Uh, we don't rely just on our church to provide funding, although our church is, is great at supporting our ministry work. We have a lot of uh, partnerships in the community with many other organizations. Uh, and so if we lose one funding source, then that doesn't mean we're in financial difficulty. Uh, as I've said repeatedly, we need to build creative partnerships. One of the things that I think we've done well is communicate with all of these organizations that are financial partners for us. 
Um, we do a monthly report that's very brief to all of our uh, all of our donors, all of our funding partners, so that they know exactly what's going on with Samaritan Ministry, exactly how their funds are being used. And we're told by people that give us money that that's a rather unusual strategy, and it, and it works. Um, HIV is a changing uh, is it has, is a changing uh, disease. It's changing all the time. True for all of these things we've talked about: mental health, diabetes, heart disease, all the other chronic diseases we've mentioned. Hepatitis C. Oh my goodness! So many changes just in the last year with hepatitis C. It's important as church uh, church folk, as as community leaders, of faith leaders to be up to date on the science of what's going on out there in the community. So that when we're asked to step up to the plate in our church or in other places in our community, we can speak to good science and we know what's going on. Next slide. So anyway, I want to thank you all very much again. Uh, you can email me. At, uh, the, these are both email addresses. Our our website is SamaritanCentral.org, uh, and please uh, visit us there. Uh, we'll try to answer any questions that you have at the conclusion of this uh, of my time at the, at the end of this uh, webinar, which I think is probably coming up. I think uh, my time's about over. Again, it's been a pleasure talking with you today about Samaritan Ministry. Thanks, Wayne. Um, I just uh, next slide. Um, really briefly, just wanted to let you know that uh, many of the resources that we mentioned are available. Next slide. In our faith leader toolkit, um, these are just resources that uh, focus on diabetes prevention and management that will that you can incorporate into your activities. Uh, it's available in English and in Spanish. Next slide. Um, and it just has a variety of resources in it. We just we talked about it more in detail on our last webinar. But uh, next slide. Um, it has a variety of uh, resources that you can use for promotion. If you want to start some kind of educational classes, it has some resources in there for that. And if you are looking for training uh, to learn more about diabetes or more about planning diabetes uh, programs, it has some resources in there to help you with that as well. Uh, next slide. And you can find it on our website, and we'll send out the link. Next slide. And we will, and I'll turn it over to Betsy to do the conclusion. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was told I was breaking up a bit when I was doing my presentation. Please don't you worry. We're going to share with you the slides and all the steps that I explained in my section are there, um, um, and they're very easy to follow. So I would like to conclude our webinar today by recapping for you um, some of the great tips that we get from um, Wayne Smith and from Alexis and from the many things that we have been trying to with you in this very packed time. Uh, I think that we have in front of us an opportunity. An opportunity is, not, is knocking at our doors to, to reach people. And church-based organizations seems to be one of the way to go. So, um, and then summarizing some of the great lesson learned from um, Wayne, um, being the first one, the importance of reaching out to the community and not looking to just people that look like us. Um, he also mentioned about the power of church showing in unexpected places and sometimes on traditional places. In, in, in other words, getting out of the walls of the church into the communities. He also talked about touching people and loving people and focusing on what unites us instead of what separates us. He also said do not rely in just one way to secure funds. In fact, she was, he was suggesting to create a multi-source funding sources. He also mentioned to us the importance of keeping updates to provide the latest information because of all of these um, 
diseases that we have been talking about, HIV, diabetes, diseases, hepatitis B, there's a lot of that is, you know, of showing us from the evidence. Let's say, for example, in diabetes, technology is making a huge impact on how people are managed. So that, you know, keeping up to the latest of that information is very important. And it's also, um, I would like to also to conclude this um, opportunity knocking way of showing this is that it takes time to engage leaders in and, and Wayne suggested to us the importance of engaging key leaders of the organization. So as I, as I said, we have an opportunity knocking our doors and we're hoping that through these webinars and the first one that we did, you at least have some resources on your hand that you can um, use. You, we're going to be sharing our emails with you. So if you have any more questions and you want to reach us for the resources or for any of the um, information that we sh share with us, please feel free to do it. Uh, Maria has been um, sharing with you many links of many resources that we all mentioned during our presentation today. Hopefully those will also help you. So now I would like to transition to, um, um, to Diana who will be concluding this webinar. Thank you. <clears throat> to all our speakers, Alexis and Betsy from the CDC, and uh, Mr. Smith uh, Wayne from the Samaritan Ministry. Now we would like to have a few uh, direct some questions to you from the public. The first one to Betsy, one of the participants, uh, one of the um, audience members asked, Given that you pointed uh, a few uh, emphasis on sustainability, she would like to have a few takeaways. Uh, although you presented uh, quite a bit of information, but a few takeaways um, for the public to keep in mind, or and or to point them to a website that they can find further information. Well, sustainability is always a big issue. And I think that my best takeaway is that while you're planning your um, initiative program or whatever that you're trying to do, keep in mind that planning includes how this plan, uh, how this uh, organization will be promoted, and how do you um, envision that the program will sustain. Um, Wayne mentioned to us to keep more than one source of funding, and I also mentioned that it's not only about money, but it's also about the capacity that you develop in order to develop, to implement these programs. There are many ways on how to do this. I, I can share with you, and I think I shared this with our previous, um, our previous um, um, webinar, but um, this is something that is working quite well in my organization, and I just want to share the successes we have. Uh, we were getting together the, the, the church-based leaders and my volunteers to find out how we can find strategies that could help us sustain the, our initiative in our church. And we find out that by visiting um, the local uh, Latino uh, markets that we are in the circumference of our church, um, will be was a way to go. So we invite, we invite them to a lunch in our church. They all came. We presented the program, and then we're asking for donations from them. So the way we came up with this donation system was that um, we agreed that for that the members will buy their in their grocery stores, and they will bring to us their receipts. At the end of each month, I meant with along with with the other um, uh, congregation members, we meet with the with the, with the um, um, owners of, of these um, cases, and we share with them all the receipts that we were able to get from our church, uh, and then we present that to them, and they will give us a 10% of what members were invested there. So we, this is our strategy that we have been including more and more, so because, you know, some of them stay for us with a couple of years, and they drop off, 
they uh, we visit them and re-energize and then get in again we we get new ones so to make a long story a short one we have been able to keep this strategy alive for almost four years now and we are the income that we're getting out of this partnership with the local market is around three thousand dollars on a monthly basis so again this is just a matter of be creative uh, look to what others have been doing. I'm always Googling on church-based interventions to see how they are doing related with funding. And, and I make a list of all those resources, and we try and see what happens. So I'll just give you a complete example. Thank you, Betsy. The same question we have for Wayne. Wayne, do you have some takeaways uh, from the church point of view in getting off the ground with uh, programs like this? Well, um, uh, for us, you know, I, if you're, if this is a financial question that you're asking, I'm not sure. Um, we realized that uh, our church was an important part of uh, get uh, support was going to be an important part of getting support, but um, our church doesn't have unlimited resources. And so we began to look around in our community and uh, and outside of our community for places to get support. And one of the things that's available in all the communities around the country are there's a public library um, uh, resource data bank of grants and uh, private foundations that are funding sources for a variety of things. And it's a it's a database that the public libraries maintain. You can't get it online. Um, you have to go through a little bit of training with the, with the librarian. And it's free, but it, it, you do have to go through the public library. And you can find uh, a lot of resources with organizations and individuals who would be interested in the same issue that your group might be interested in uh, in your geographical area. And we were able to access two or three of those early on to help with this um, creative kind of funding so that we could spread that around a little bit. Thank you, Wayne. Alexis, um, a question for you is around the resources uh, that you were pointing at. If there is any training available for churches when they access the materials online? So there is some online training. We have the training for community-based organizations. That's around um, supporting people with diabetes. Um, and then some of our tools, um, like our New Beginnings, which is a dis uh, support group or discussion group for people with diabetes and their families, has some training. Um, we also have a series of web, uh, our Road to Health Toolkit, which is about diabetes prevention, that has some training. And then we have a series of webinars on our uh, website. Those will train you in different topics related to communication or partnerships, uh, food insecurity, dealing with a number of issues. Um, I would also suggest that you reach out locally for in-person training. Um, so your local American Diabetes Association, your local diabetes educators, uh, your local health department. Um, there are a variety of uh, uh, local and county health departments, local diabetes coalitions. There are a variety of community-based organizations out there that uh, may also provide some training around these various topics as well. So. Um, do check out our website, but also, you know, talk to people in your community and look at the resources that exist in your community for training as well. Thank you, Alexis. And we want mm -hmm. to thank all our participants as well. Uh, all answers that we're, we were not able to answer for you today, we're going to um, address later on after this webinar. Also, at next slide, please. Also, uh, remember that at the end of this webinar, we will have uh, a quick evaluation that will pop up in your image um, uh, on, your, on your computer. Uh, also, all registered participants will receive a, an email with a link that would include the recording of this webinar. 
including, again, a link to the evaluation of this uh, webinar if you didn't have a chance to answer right after the webinar. Your feedback is important. We want to continue providing these uh, resources to you and, um, and improve as we go on. Now we're up on the hour, and thanks again for your time and for participating today to all our speakers. Thank you very much. Goodbye.